All right, welcome everyone to the Office of Undergraduate Research Education Series. We are so excited to have you here for the Funding Graduate School session. We are joined here by Dr. Matthew Pluster, who we'll introduce to you in a minute, um, but there's just some uh, you know, housekeeping stuff we wanna go through before we get started. So this is a reminder that this is a virtual event and it is being recorded. So um, if you wanna turn off your camera, um, that's totally fine. If you want your speaker to see you attentively looking back at them, that's also up to you. You are welcome to turn your camera on or off. We do ask that you mute yourself to ensure an optimal sound experience. If you have questions, please use the chat feature or unmute yourself when you are invited by the speaker. Um, we are super excited to um, get started soon. But just a little bit of a reminder for our undergraduate research uh, students who are Europe scholars. So um, are receiving a Europe Scholar, we just want to remind you um, that to receive credit for this event, you can go ahead and uh, fill out the form. We are also documenting your attendance. But for those that are joining us after this event has been posted, we uh, require that you submit the evaluation form. So we're really excited uh, to hear your feedback, though. So we welcome all of your feedback, whether you are Europe Scholars or not. It's really helpful um, so we can continue to improve on our series and make sure the events reflect what you are all need. So just a little bit of a reminder of the mission of the Office of Undergraduate Research. Our mission is to facilitate and promote undergraduate, student, faculty, collaborative research and creative works in all disciplines throughout the University of Utah campus. In recognition that excellence requires diversity, we pursue this mission through equitable programming that promotes diverse representation and social justice. At the University of Utah, we acknowledge that this land, which is named for the Ute tribe, is the traditional and ancestral homeland of the Shoshone, Paiute, Goshute, and Ute tribes. The University of Utah recognizes and respects the enduring relationships that exist between many indigenous peoples and their traditional homelands. We respect the sovereign relationship between tribes, states and the federal government and we affirm the University of Utah's commitment to a partnership with Native nations and urban Indian communities through research, education and community outreach activities. So now without further ado, who you're all really here to hear from, further ado, I would like to welcome to all of you, Dr. Matthew Pluster, who is the Director of Graduate Fellowships, Awards and Benefits, so really an expert on this topic um, with the Graduate School at the University of Utah. Good morning and thank you so much, Annie, for that wonderful introduction. I am so pleased to be here with you today. Uh, some of you who are longtime uh, participants may have uh, joined this last year, and hopefully I can enrich what you remember from last year as well. Um, as, as mentioned, I'm Dr. Matthew Pluster with the Graduate School Office of Fellowships, Awards, and Benefits. And uh, today we're going to talk in general terms about funding graduate school. I know some of you are uh, preparing right now for graduate school. Some of you are looking ahead at what you'll be doing down the road. And some of you are considering the University of Utah. Absolutely, you should. But some of you may have your eye on programs uh, outside of the University of Utah. So I'm hoping that this will be helpful for you as you prepare wherever you choose to go. So what we'll cover today is the different types of graduate funding and where to find it. Uh, funding timelines, when to apply, this differs a bit by type of funding. Some application advice for you, some common mistakes that I see with students, and then making a plan and what you can do today, what you can start doing now. So we'll go ahead and jump in with the types of funding. Well, firstly, let's ask ourselves, why seek funding? I get this question a lot. Um, really, we think money, I need money. Uh, but a lot of students will go into graduate school working in a lab where uh, they will be funded. They will have a research assistantship and they will uh, have their tuition covered. So they don't need to go and seek funding, so to say. But here are a couple of reasons why. Firstly, the prestige. It really looks great on a CV or a resume to say, I was a national defense fellow or I was a National Science Foundation graduate fellow or what have you. Um, 
the fu funding, of course, for direct costs, tuition, fees, uh, living support. Uh, fellowships primarily do come with some level of living support. Research and project funding, so less general and more specific, uh, travel to go and conduct your research, uh, to purchase equipment, go to conferences, bolster graduate admission opportunities. This is something that is specifically helpful for you as uh, undergrads, particularly rising seniors, looking at where you want to go to graduate school. For example, I work with uh, one particular award, the NSF GRFP, and students will apply to some big schools in their respective programs like Duke, MIT, uh, California Tech, et cetera, and they will get waitlisted or there's just not enough seats, they'll get rejected, and then they get offered the National Science Foundation Fellowship, and they'll call up the school and say, hey, is there any way we can reevaluate my application? I just got the GRFB, and boom, they're in. Um, carrying funding with you, especially funding that is mobile to go uh, to any school you choose to, is a big card you can play during the admissions process. Uh, mentorship and professional development opportunities. A lot of uh, a lot of opportunities out there come with not just funding, but they want to help develop you as a scholar and as a uh, burgeoning leader, as a le uh, future leader of our uh, campuses, of our communities, of our nation. Uh, fellowships and other graduate funding can lead to postdoc or career opportunities, open additional doors for you. And this is particularly salient for those of you who are looking at careers in academia, whether as a researcher or in the professoriate, this helps you establish a pattern and a history of seeking funding and fingers crossed getting funding. Because once you are uh, a research professor or a teaching professor, you're going to be writing those grants to the NIH, the NSF, NASA, et cetera, to bring in that funding to conduct your research. So this is really valuable experience to have getting and securing funding. So the five primary areas of graduate funding is graduate fellowships. This is the most exciting part. Then we have tuition waivers, which sometimes just kind of goes as an afterthought. We don't think about, as we approach graduate school, tuition waiver. Uh, scholarship and project funding, this is going to be more on the specific side rather than general. Various assistantships that you can participate in. And then, of course, state and federal aid. So diving right into graduate fellowships, this is meant to allow you the bandwidth to focus on your scholarly endeavors. Uh, this could be early, a pre-doc, so during your coursework. This could be as you start your research and do your data collection and such. This can be at the end with your dissertation completion. Uh, graduate fellowships are oftentimes local to your institution or your community, your professional community as well as nationally competitive from national funding agencies. Grad fellows, graduate fellowships usually come as a full-time award. And what full-time means is provides you with a stipend, usually covers tuition to some extent, uh, quite often completely, and uh, sometimes some other supplementary funding, such as uh, a stipend for your mentor, uh, travel funding, research funding, et cetera. And some of these, as a result, have exclusivity requirements. You can't get three national fellowships and stack them all together uh, and get paid $100,000 a year. Some students try that, and it does not work. Um, but others are a little bit more lenient. So that's always something to ask. Applications for a graduate fellowship generally include a personal statement, a research statement, Examples of scholarly activity, a timeline, what does grad school look like for you, or what does your research project itself look like for you, and then letters of recommendation. Now, your research statement, I get questions from students all across the board, but particularly rising seniors. I'm not even, I've not even submitted my application for grad school yet, and you want me to propose a research project? Yes. <laughs> what is the project that you're envisioning doing when you're in school. Uh, I, I, I caution students regularly, don't worry so much about this. Work with your research advisor, work with a potential PI at the school that you plan to apply to um, on this, conceptualizing this, what will this look like? 
uh, with, with my NSF students, for example, I have to remind them, there are no NSF fellowship police who are going to come to you and say, hey, John or Jane, you proposed this research project, but in the actual execution of your project, you took that in kind of a different direction. So give us our money back. That's not going to happen to you. Um, this is an investment into your future, and they want to see that you're really doing your due diligence. And of course, many nationally funded competitive fellowships take that into consideration. So you as a rising senior will not be compared next to someone who's a third year PhD student. Frequently, you will be uh, evaluated in different grades. Okay. To find these, always start first on campus in your program with your, your faculty advisor, your PI. They may have fellowship funding opportunities for you. Your department, your college, here at the University of Utah, we have a centralized, decentralized model. So I administer certain fellowships, university funded fellowships here, and individual colleges have their own donor funded full-time fellowships that they administer as well. Then you'll always want to talk to your graduate division wherever you attend. Here at the University of Utah, this would be my office, as well as auxiliary services. So here at the University of Utah, this could be like the um, LGBT Resource Center, Women's Resource Center, and other similar service areas. Research databases like Pivot, which all of you have access through, uh, access to through CIS as a student. This is not only where graduate students and even undergraduate students look for funding. This is where your professors oftentimes go to look for funding. And uh, you can go in, set up your profile, and search by keywords, different opportunities. And this really does go global, not just what's available here in Utah or at the University of Utah or even the United States, but what other countries or funding agencies in other countries are interested in funding. And it could be your research. And nationally competitive agencies, uh, Fulbright, NSF, NDSEG, National Defense uh, Fellowship for STEM, um, ACLS Mellon, the APA, the American Association of University Women, et cetera. These are wonderful opportunities. And a quick note on applying, should you apply? Yes. The students who come to me and say, I would have applied for Fulbright or I would have applied for AAUW, but I'm just not good enough of a student. And those are the students I look at their applications and they would have been the winners, I feel, uh, in my experience. They are highly competitive. So there's a humility that we have in higher ed, especially when you start your grad degrees, you really feel that humility. But this is your time, fellowships, is your time to say, hey, I actually know what I'm talking about here and I've done research. I have this experience. So it's your opportunity to own that. And uh, some examples I kind of already mentioned, the Fulbright Scholars Program. This is for you to go and pursue graduate education. Uh, there's an opportunity for you to go and teach English in a foreign country. And this is also an opportunity for programs, not necessarily specific to you, but for programs to bring in students to their programs here on campus from other countries. The NSF Graduate Research Fellowship, for those of you who are going to be uh, seniors pretty soon or going into graduate school next year, they just upped their uh, annual stipend from 34000 to 37000 so a little extra money there. The Mellon ACLS Dissertation Innovation Fellowship, the AAUW, which is for uh, female identifying students, really in all disciplines from starting your uh, graduate education all the way through postdoc, and international students are eligible for that award. NDSEG, this is really more on the engineering side. Uh, AC, uh, ASF, this is the American Scandinavian Foundation Scholarship and Fellowship Awards, although again, from starting grad school all the way through postdoc. And foundations like ASF, and this is just one example, but there are many others similar to this, they're not funding a specific type of research, they're funding a connection. So let's say that you are a biomed student and you are collaborating with your research at uh, with, with a professor at the University of London, Sweden. They want to fund you to go and pursue that research project. Or if your data collection site for an anthropology project is in, in um, 
Norway or Denmark, they can fund help fund that research project or your travel or whatnot. Number of opportunities similar to that. Some frequently asked questions about specific specific to graduate fellowships. Are international students eligible? It really does depend on the funding agency. If they are federally funded, like the National Science Foundation, you need to be a United States citizen or permanent resident. International students and undocumented students are not eligible. But then there are other opportunities where they are. So always ask. Um, never hesitate to, if there's a phone number on a funding agency's website, don't hesitate to call them unless they say don't call. Some do say that. Um, can I have multiple fellowships at once? Well, this depends on the ward. Some allow you to stack, others don't. So check with the funding agency and check with your university as well. Are non-traditional students eligible? Yes, <laughs> please. If you are, if you identify as a non-traditional student, please apply and pursue these opportunities. You are just as welcome as anyone else out there. If anything, with uh, some of the awards I help students pursue, Non-traditional students come in with such a unique perspective, with a uh, life experience, industry experience that students on the traditional path from undergrad to grad school don't necessarily bring in. So you have a lot more to enrich your applications with. And I'm seeing a lot more non-traditional students being awarded. So you have a place out there in the fellowship world. Am I required to have research experience or published articles to apply? Generally speaking, this is a, a no, you do not. But this does depend on the agency. Uh, the NSF, for example, do you have to have published articles, presentations at conference? No. Do you need research experience? It's gonna, you're going to have a really hard time being competitive for that award without research experience. Plenty of other awards, especially those at the beginning and more on the humanities side, they don't expect that you have significant research experience. So don't let that hold you back. And are master students eligible? Depends. You're going to find better luck with institutionally funded scholarships and fellowships. So that's where you'd go talk to your department, talk to your college, especially business students, talk to your college. That's where you're going to find the vast, vast majority of your opportunities. But Generally speaking as well, research fellowships are reserved more for PhDs. That's just a generality. Check with your funding agency, check with your research advisor uh, for their advice on that as well. Now, tuition waivers. Again, as, as I mentioned earlier, this kind of gets kind of forgotten. Uh, it's not as sexy as um, graduate fellowships. It's not as specific need oriented as project funding and it's not a last resort like some would say like federal loans but it's a wonderful area where you can find at least your major college expense cover at minimum so waivers and yeah. discounts uh this can waive all your tuition or a portion of your tuition and these this is largely um, tied to an assistantship, being a teaching assistant, being a research assistant, and we'll talk about assistantships later on. Uh, where to find these waivers? On campus, generally going to your graduate department and say, I'm interested in a tuition waiver. It's as simple as that to get the ball rolling. Uh, some areas, some colleges and universities, you'll find that is actually managed at the graduate division, such as my office at other universities. Here at the University of Utah, it's your program. Sometimes the tuition office as well, they can point you in the right direction or they may even provide the resource. And I want to put a plug in here for the for WICHE, the Western Interstate Commission of Higher Education. They have graduate programs as well as undergraduate programs. Some of you may be here studying on the Western Undergraduate Exchange uh, discount program. There's a graduate version of that, the Western Region Graduate Program, WRGP. And so if you are planning to pursue graduate education, uh, if you are from Utah, and you plan to go to Washington, California, Arizona, any of the witchy states, and you can go to their website and see the states and territories, which includes Hawaii, um, Guam, US Virgin Islands, et cetera. Uh, 
you could have a discount of up to 100, uh, paying only 100% of what resident tuition is in that state. So that you would still have a tuition bill, but a significant savings, significant savings. Scholarships and project funding. So we talked about graduate fellowships, which is non-work. It's a stipend to help you focus. Scholarships and fellowships. Uh, Scholarships and project funding, on the other hand, this is more for specific rather than fellowships that help you go to school, do your coursework, start your projects, get to the finish line. This is for specific needs. These generally are much smaller awards, uh, ranging from just a couple of dollars for this need or that need to a couple thousand. And I do have to say, these are generally very stackable. You can get as much as you can get. And it adds up pretty quickly. So never say, oh, well, you know, that's only 200 bu bucks, not worth my effort. It's worth your effort and apply for all of them. Uh, these are generally uh, to help supplement your direct costs, your tuition, your fees, but they also are available, especially from external funding agencies for specific needs that you might have. Uh, you might not have the funding in your program to take you to a conference where you're going to present a poster or share research or network. You might not have the funding to, uh, instead of use administrative data for your dissertation, but you wanna go somewhere and do one-on-one -on -one direct data collection, but you don't have the funding to do that kind of travel. That's where specific scholarships and project funding awards can help you. Uh, so definitely pursue those. You'll find these again in your, with your research advisor, your PI, your program, your department, your graduate division, and auxiliary services. Pretty much anywhere on campus, you can find this, depending on how your campus is structured. Um, you can find these in Pivot. We've talked about Pivot already. And additionally, professional and community organizations and foundations. If you are uh, a student and you're part of the uh, such and such engineering organization or such and such uh, neuro neurology, Neurological Study Association or whatnot, they have student awards to help with research, to take you to conferences, and sometimes big dollar fellowships as well. Okay, graduate assistantships, and I put some comics here because sometimes a visual can be fun. Why, why, why TA, this gal asks, and she has a student who's very interested, asking a lot of questions, and she says, you know, it pays the bills, it looks good on a CV, and there's that undergrad student that really makes it worth your effort and makes it worth your day to go in TA. Um, graduate assistantships come in various opportunities. There's a uh, teaching assistantship, you're probably all very familiar with that. Research assistantships, some of you may be working in a lab right now. Uh, some administrative assistantships where you go and help uh, run a program, for example. Uh, these are meant to enhance and enrich your graduate experience. Assistantships are meant to help you as much as possible, not have to rely on employment outside of campus, but stay on campus where you're kind of protected. You're not usually don't have to work when you have finals. There's that level of flexibility. Uh, they don't work you over a certain period so that you can balance out work and your studies. And um, it's meant to enhance. So for example, if you are a mechanical engineering graduate student and you're working in a research lab as a research assistant, that's going to give you a lot of good skills to conduct your own research experiment, uh, write your dissertation and go work in industry research or a uh, federal research lab. Uh, you might be a history student who spends five years of your PhD teaching classes. That's going to really put you ahead of other candidates for teaching university positions in the professoriate to give you that experience that really enhances your experience in the classroom as a student. Uh, this often, but not always, is accompanied by a tuition waiver. So that's how we do this here at the University of Utah for the most part. You teach a class, you earn a certain amount of money that semester, you get a certain portion, 50, 75, or 100% of your resident tuition covered and a non-resident waiver. So but it's not always a given. So always ask that question when you're talking about assistantships with potential programs. Uh, where to find? Start with your program. That's going to be the most key place to start. Second after that is 
look at professors who are doing research similar to you. This could take you to research labs outside of your department. And then also thirdly, look at PIs conducting research specific to your skills. Right now, you may be working in a research lab where you are doing a certain type of data collection, a certain type of data analysis. You go off to grad school and you might not find some opportunities in your own department, but there may be a prof professor across campus who's doing that same type of data analysis that you have the skills for, and that could provide you with a job and potentially tuition coverage. And again, more experience on your resume. So uh, when we see this quite a bit, especially with statistical analysis, students in, I've had social work students go and work in architecture, um, uh, fine art students go and work in nursing, taking their research skills with them. Some questions that I get asked about graduate assistants, are international students eligible? Largely, yes. It really does depend on how the assistantship is funded. Uh, depending on the funding source, some federal or state funding sources don't allow, but generally speaking, like the big federal funders, NIH, NSF, uh, National Defense, NASA, are A-OK -okay with international students um, on assistantships. A quick note about international students. Um, you have to get work authorization uh, that is specific to your visa, your F-1 or your J-1 visa, or there's a few other visas out there that you could be on as well. Um, you have to get clearance through your university, and you will potentially be taxed at a rate separate than locals, uh, domestic students are, uh, depending on the country of your uh, of your home, of your residency, and the type of visa you're on, you could have your wages taxed up to 35%. Uh, so wherever you go to school, talk with your HR department if you're pursuing a job or their tax services. Here at the U, we have a tax service office, other institutions that are smaller, that'll be part of HR, uh, to ask about, hey, I'm from this country and I'm on this visa and I'm taking this job. What does that look like tax-wise? So you can financially prepare. Can I have multiple assistantships? Generally, this is a no. Um, but sometimes we do find where it works out quite well. And this is usually where instead of uh, working a, a normal teaching assistantship, you work half of that, and then you work a little bit in a research lab, and still it does not exceed 20 hours a week. That's kind of the sweet spot, 20 or fewer hours a week. Um, so that's something to ask your PI generally. Can I have another job off campus? It uh, depends on the circumstance. Uh, here at the University of Utah, for example, what we don't know can't hurt us. You can't have a full-time job on campus and a teaching assistantship because there are some HR rules and policies around that that prohibit that. But if you want to go and work at a research firm off campus and then do a teaching assistantship on campus, we don't know that necessarily. So that's a judgment call for you to make. That said, assistantships are meant to not put more cash in your pocket necessarily, but to replace the burden of external employment and replace it with uh, something more conducive to enriching your educational experience on campus. I work full time and I, am I eligible? Generally, no. Are master's students eligible? This will depend on your area of study, but largely yes. And are non-traditional students eligible? Absolutely, generally, yes. Always ask. Now, uh, state and federal aid. So this is primarily for graduate students, unsubsidized federal loans. Um, Pell grants are not available at the graduate level. Uh, the um, supplementary educational opportunity grant, not available at the graduate level. So it's primary loans. Uh, there are some grants available uh, such as the TEACH grant, if any of you are pursuing uh, a graduate degree for uh, elementary education, secondary education, the TEACH grant could be a fantastic opportunity for you. Uh, federal work study, so let's say an assistantship isn't an option. Fed federal work study is where you go and work on campus. It's usually going to be uh, less of a professional position than your research assistantship would be, um, but it helps you balance out um, there are some federal rules, such as if you have a test that week, you can't work more than a certain number of hours, et cetera. Um, eligibility is determined for any state or federal aid 
by the FAFSA. And I will say this for scholarships, if there's a need-based component, you need to fill out the FAFSA as well. Um, use of state and federal aid may limit eligibility for other aid. Some of you may have uh, seen like this cost of attendance over award thing, still applies at the graduate level. Not available to international students, generally speaking. Federal financial aid isn't, some state aid may be. Uh, ask your, the financial aid office at the university that you choose to attend. And then of course, check with your financial aid office for any questions on that. Some frequently asked questions I get, how often do I need to complete the FAFSA annually, every year? Will I automatically have loans if I complete the FAFSA? No, not at all. Completion of the FAFSA is simply determining your eligibility. You will, if you want loans, if you're eligible for loans, you will then have to proactively accept those loans. So you will not, by hitting submit on your FAFSA, automatically have loan debt. Um, will my loans be forgiven? This is a really hot topic right now. Uh, we get a lot of questions about this. Public service loan forgiveness is currently operational. Uh, you have to work for a public organization like a university, a nonprofit, uh, a government organization in a full-time capacity uh, and uh, for 10 years. Uh, that does not have to be 10 consecutive years either. Um, and then once 120 payments are made at the income-driven repayment rate, you get the remainder forgiven. That's still operational. Um, loan forgiveness, especially the... the um, the hot topic right now, the, the Biden 10, 10 to $20,000 forgiveness that is determined, uh, that is currently on hold, but these are questions you would take to your servicer, your loan servicer, uh, but largely loan forgiveness as well as federal aid in general is determined by Congress. So concerns about that, you would want to share with your congressional representatives. Can I have a work-study job and an assistantship? Potentially, it depends on the circumstance, what the assistantship is, how many hours the federal work-study job would be, et cetera. And do work-study jobs come with tuition coverage? They do not. Okay, funding timeline. It's always important to have a to-do list um, in school and then to follow through with the to-do list. Ran into that problem multiple times myself. Um, this is the... Uh, a really brief illustration of the three areas of funding for fellowships, but this applies really to larger graduate funding. We have your pre-doc um, funding, which is when you're starting, you're uh, coming into a PhD program or uh, you are in the beginning steps of your PhD program. Uh, then we have mid-career. This is when you, uh, you finish coursework. You may have passed your comprehensive exams, by this point, or you might be preparing for your exams, uh, this is when you're proposing your research, you're starting your research. Then we have late career. This is when you are in really the final year of your dissertation or project. And during that fellowship year, you finish, you reach the finish line, you submit you, your manuscript, you get your degree cleared, you get the diploma in the mail. That's the goal for uh, the late career awards. So breaking down these different areas, the five different types of funding we talked about, fellowships, uh, when starting a program, you wanted to have a conversation about this, pre uh, preferably concurrent with your conversations about being admitted to a program. Ask about fellowship opportunities. Uh, when starting research, so again, that mid-career, and then when nearing completion. So those are kind of the three guideposts for fellowships. Tuition waivers and discount programs, Talk about this at admissions, when you are being recruited for a program, when you're submitting your application, when they extend an offer of admission to you. Assistantships, this is largely when you're ready. So some programs will admit you and have you start teaching that first semester in the grad program. Other programs, they want you to uh, get at least a year under your belt in the, in the grad program before you start teaching undergrads. Research, sometimes they take you right at the beginning or they want you to uh, get your qualifying exams first before you start working in a research lab. It really depends on your program. Scholarships and project funding. Uh, if, if it's a general award, you want to annually be looking at these. And annually is really an all-year thing because opportunities open and close all year long. 
And if project specific, this isn't something that you'll necessarily seek annually, but when you are anticipating a need. So more in that mid-career, maybe that late career area. So if you are proposing your research and you know that next year I'm going to need funding to travel to this country to conduct my research, I need to start looking for travel funding to go and do that research project. And then state and federal aid, again, this is the FAFSA, you do that annually. Some application advice, uh, write, and if you were like me during some of my degrees, an IV of coffee right into the bloodstream is very helpful. I say that figuratively, that is not a safe thing to be doing, uh, literally. Uh, fully read eligibility. This is something from undergrads to grads to postdocs that I see. People do not read the fine print. And it's usually to, to an unfortunate detriment, people overlooking great opportunities. And a big part of this comes down to needing to differentiate requirement from preference. So let's say there's an opportunity out there, a grad fellowship for a student in humanities and social science. Okay. But then it goes on to say, uh, with a high preference for those who are pursuing um, economic policy. So that'd be like sociology, economics, political science students. And you say to yourself, well, hey, I'm, I'm studying psychology, um, like early uh, child development. I'm not eligible for that. Well, that's a preference. The economic policy is a preference. Psychology is a social science. You you meet the base eligibility. So you should absolutely continue per, reading through and pursuing that opportunity. So really differentiate requirement from preference. If you do not meet the requirement, you're not eligible. If you don't meet the preferences, you still have a really good shot. Um, there is a big myth in the student financial aid world, undergrads and grads, where you may, and you may have been told this, you may have been told that this, this year, apply for everything, even if you're not eligible, because money goes unawarded every year. Um, if money goes unawarded, it's because there's no eligible applicant. It's not because there are no applicants. Um, and most funding, especially here on campus, funding is tied by a legal document. So if they were to award it to someone who's not eligible, that creates legal liability. And so we don't do that. So apply for what you're eligible for. Understand the requirements of the application. So we kind of went over this already. Personal statement, research statement, timeline, letters of recommendation. Uh, there may be a few other requirements in there. And make a realistic timeline, realistic timeline. You're not going to go through 20 drafts of a personal statement reviewed by 25 people and be ready in one week. No matter how much of an optimist you are, a hard worker you are, that's not going to work out. So space things out. Um, for some of my awards, I advise students on NSF, GRFP, the Ford Fellowship, uh, ACLS, Mellon. I tell students three months. If you have the, the bandwidth, six months. Does it take six months to write a National Science Foundation Graduate Research Fellow application? No, it does not but you don't wanna write your application under duress of a timeline. You wanna give yourself space. You wanna have the right people look at it. You wanna go through multiple drafts. If you are submitting an application with a narrative and you that's the first draft, your, your chances are significantly reduced. So you wanna take the time, you really wanna think thoughtfully about these things. And as one consultant once said to me, um, your, 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 your students are spending how much time on their application? And a, a, a student responded, oh, like an hour. Okay, so you're spending an hour on a potential of $40,000 a year for five years. Should you, is that worth an hour or is that worth maybe a little bit more than an hour of time? So you want to think of it from a larger perspective. Um, immediately schedule an appointment with your research and faculty advisor, even if you're at, uh, still an undergrad at this point. Uh, whoever your academic advisor, your faculty advisor, your research advisor is, sit down and have a conversation with them because they will be pivotal part of that process in, in helping you with your research statement, with providing letters of recommendation. Um, have multiple eyes on the draft. Allow time for multiple rounds of edits. You want 
your professors, you want your advisors to read through them, you want your roommate who, let's say you're an engineer, you want your roommate who's a creative writing major to read it, uh, even if you, you feel like, oh, well, it's technical, they won't get it. You don't want to be too technical, and I'll get to that in a second. You want multiple eyes over it because you will miss things. Uh, whether specifically or indirectly, you need to address two primary things intellectual merit and broader impact. And these are very NSF terms. Intellectual merit is what's my background? How have I academically prepared? And what's the value of my research? What's the value of my degree? Uh, and that's I'm uh, contributing to science. I am contributing to this area of research will open doors to other areas of research, uh, et cetera, et cetera. Then broader impact is not what you're doing in the ivory tower of the academy, but um, let's say that I'm doing research on uh, uh, something biomedical. I come from the social sciences, so bear with me in my examples. Let's say you're doing something biomedical and you've done that intellectual merit. This is where the research is going. This is the doors that could be opened as a result. Um, and broader impacts is you're saying, this is going to directly impact patients. This is going to help people with... Um, like earlier detection of heart problems so that they can live longer, healthier lives. That is broader. That is impacting the community that we live in, our country, et cetera. Be honest. Absolutely be honest. Do not falsify your background or fictionalize your plans. Uh, a few months ago, there was a big scandal with a Rhodes Scholarship where someone did just that. You don't want to be that person. Um, and if you you knowingly falsified, you could have your money taken away from you. Uh, but you do want to be honest. If you have a sincere intention of I'm going to do X, Y, Z in graduate school, talk about it. It's a plan. But you, you, you don't want to start saying, well, I know this funding agency wants to hear this. So I'm just going to give them a line and then do my own thing. That would not be honest. Um, arrange letters of recommendation early. This can be one of the most challenging, and I will say, political things that you will do. You you might think, oh, it's just a letter, it's no big deal. Um, you need to first make sure you have the right people. If you are a grad student and your research advisor is not one of your recommend writers, you, you have a very small shot at that. That is your most important partner in seeking fellowship and external funding. Um, but recommenders, you might uh, go and ask you might have someone in mind, you want to go and talk to them. And they might say, you know, I just don't feel comfortable with this. And you leave it at that. They might feel like, oh, I just have too much on my plate. I don't have the bandwidth. Or I just really only had this person for one class. They were great in my class, but I don't feel comfortable attesting to their ability to do PhD level research based on one semester in a 2000 level class. Um, and there could be some other things out there where they might not have the most confidence in your abilities there. It does not mean that you're a bad student. It just means they're not the best recommend writer for you. So this is something you want to start early. And then you want to ensure that your recommenders know what they are addressing. Um, they might not be familiar with your fellowship that you are pursuing or the scholarship that you're pursuing. That's a high likelihood. You want to educate them on what it is, but then you also want to educate them on what they need to cover. Give them a copy of your draft so that they know what you they need to corroborate in their letter of recommendation. You also want to tell them, this is what we're looking for. NSF, for example, your, your recommend writers need to have what is a statement of originality in there saying, this is new. This is not just something they're doing in my lab and putting their name on it. This is something they are owning and investing in, and it is new research. Calendar the submission dates. This is a big one. And then mark three days before that on your calendar because you want to be able to make sure your uploads do not have any problems. And you want to make sure that your Wi-Fi does not go out. We all think it won't happen to us. It happens and it happens more than we think. Um, a lot of submission sites uh, will convert your, your documents to a PDF. Even if you submit them as a PDF, they sometimes go through the PDF converter again. So you want that time to be able to go in, upload, and review what is converted. Because sometimes there's a surprise page or 
surprise margin problems, and you want to have a, a day or so to address that. When speaking of your research, show that you understand risk. So you're going to any fellowship or external funding that you apply for, you're going to have other researchers, um, experienced researchers, experienced advisors reviewing your application. And they're going to say, oh, this kid is Pollyanna. I appreciate the optimism here, but there's like this, this, and this is going to be a huge hurdle for them. And this is probably not going to happen. Um, so you need to talk about... Um, for example, I had a student who's an anthropologist. She is going to go and do a, a, a dig of sorts in South Africa, uh, where she's working with Iron Age remains, specifically dental remains. And there's some ifs about that. And I said, what's the plan B with that? If you can't go and actually get the the data, the the, the dental samples in Africa, what do you do? And she said, well, my project, I can use some existing um artifacts out there that are digitized and actively available this is just better okay so in her uh research statement she's saying this is the ideal and by having this funding i've got this opportunity or i'm working with these people to make the connections to make this possible if for whatever reason including a global health crisis called COVID, happens here's my plan b so i can still conduct my research and get to the finish line uh, it, that shows your reviewers that you understand what you're doing and you're taking a very mature uh, uh, route with your grad school education. You're really owning what you're responsible for. Talk about your past, your background, your present, your undergrad, and your forthcoming graduate school plans, what you envision, and then your future. Your future is not next year. It's the next 30 years. When you finish your PhD or your master's, what are you doing after that? How is your graduate education pivotal for that next 30 years to be possible? If you have a grad or research advisor, make sure that they are mentioned. I'm working with Dr. So-and-so. I have experience in their lab. Um, they're your most crucial recommendation. If not, you're an undergrad right now. You're uh, thinking about grad school. You're talking with some people. You have a faculty member at another school who's trying to recruit you. Talk about you know, the schools I'm looking at, and I've made connections with this professor and this professor uh, who would be a good partner to work with should I be admitted to that program. That's perfectly okay to say, and very good to say. And if you've been admitted into a program, mention that. If not, talk about where you plan to apply or the type of program you are actively seeking. And mistakes. And this, uh, I felt this so much when I saw this image. Uh, this is why you go through many mount, uh, rounds of review. You want the small mistakes. He doesn't want to hear it. And she says, well, you misspelled your name. Um, people do that. And you don't want to be that person. The biggest mistake I see is formatting. Every fellowship I advise on has different formatting requirements. And I wish they were all the same, but they're not. Um, that'd make life easier for all my students. I tell my students, if you do not get this award, it's I want it to be because the applicant pool is so broad. There are so many good applicants, so many winning applicants that the reviewers were pulling out their hair, trying to choose, you know, uh, uh, Sophie's choice. Who, which proposal do they uh, champion? I do not want you to be administratively kicked out in the first round before it even gets read by a reader because your margins are off. I, I, I want you to have every chance. So, so check your formatting requirements and then make a list of it. And then every time you go through your draft, make sure margins are correct. Spacing is correct. Color of font, font type, font size, et cetera. Everything is as it should be. Co do not copy and paste application narratives from one application to another. Absolutely take what you did for this foundation application, move it over here, finesse it, restructure it. That's fine. Um, uh, and, and what I see also with that copy and paste is some agencies will say, submit this full proposal, but then I want an abstract. And what some students will do is they will copy and paste like the first paragraph or a couple paragraphs of their proposal 
and put that in the box for the abstract. And as one very, very powerful funding agency said to me about this, if we're asking for something separate, we want something separate. If we if we wanted you to copy paste, we wouldn't ask for it. So if you see something you feel like is a repetition, it's really probably not a repetition and they want something unique. Um, big mistake is not taking ownership of your research experience and your uh, and your research uh, and in your own research. I read a lot of applications where people say, well, we did this and my PI did that. Well, that's great. Great that you had that experience, but what did you do in the lab? What was your responsibility in that lab? Oh, well, I did this. Okay, take ownership of that. Um, readers do not want to see we, my PI, et cetera, et cetera, because they are funding you. They're not funding your PI. They're not funding your PI's research. They are funding you and your, your education, your trajectory, your research, your leadership development. Um, statements and narratives not organized and not chronological. As you talk about your background, uh, your present, your future, you want to keep it in that order, not going back and forth. You want to make reading your statements as easy as possible for your readers. Um, you don't want them to feel like it's work because largely speaking, they are doing this at 11 o'clock at night or over Christmas vacation when they are locking themselves up in a room from their family and they want to spend time with their family, not read essays. So you want to make this as easy and not stressful as possible. Not having peers review, that, that shows when I read a, a, an application narrative, this was not reviewed by anyone else, was it? Yeah, you need that. Too much technical jargon uh, in the discussion, too much minutia. The chances of, let's say you're a biomedical student or a mechanical engineering student, the chances of someone reading your research statement who's in your specific area of research, zero. The chance of, with a lot of the big agencies, it being read by, a, an, if you're a mechanical engineering student, another mechanical engineering, an, a mechanical engineer, it's pretty iffy, iffy. You need to speak broadly. And I say this is like the elevator pitch here. You need to you need to take your complex idea and you need to explain it in a very pithy way that a chemist or an anthropologist will understand it. Um, a lot of students feel like they have to really put in as much jargon. They have to make it sound as technical as possible to really validate the I know what I'm talking about. In reality, and, and I, I think a lot of the colleagues on this call, uh, would agree a, a lot of really showing that you are a leading professional in this, you're a, a fledging professional in this, is being able to take your complex idea and make it easy for anyone to understand, breaking it down so that your stakeholders understand what you're doing. And what I say with this is, as I mentioned, I'm a social scientist. I'm not, I, I, I was not in STEM. If I can take an engineering or a biology research proposal and read it and understand what you're doing, that's a win. If I have to stop and say, I don't get this, that's not going to bode well for you. I won't necessarily understand how you're doing it or why this principle is important or whatnot, but I have a good idea of what your desired outcome is and how you're going to achieve that. That's what you want. And then assuming readers are in your field, uh, I mentioned this already, um, here for on campus, a lot of the reviewers of campus fellowships are, let's say you're in fine arts, it could be a human genetics professor that reads that. Um, same with a lot of our national foundations. Uh, if you are an engineer, it could easily be uh, an anthropologist that reads it. Uh, dense writing that's too thick to read and unengaging, you, you want a, a good hook, you want uh, a, a really nice narrative that every step along the way, the reader says, okay, I'm, I'm interested. Like, where's this going? Um, and those are night and day. So that's why we say spend time working on these uh, because that's what you want. And then making a plan and what you can do now. As an undergrad, you can do one very important thing. Apply for funding now. Practice that skill. Flex that funding muscle. because. Applying for scholarships and fellowships is not academic writing. It's not 
creative writing. It's its own special animal that it, it's an endurance sport. It's not a sprint, it's a marathon. Participate in undergraduate research opportunities and internships, things like this, as well as uh, any opportunities you have in your professor's labs. Create, and if you have one already, always keep your CV and resume up to date. I see students attached to their applications, their CVs that have not been updated in four years. And so that leads to a lot of questions like, did they not follow directions? Or are they posing as a fifth year PhD when really they start just barely started with PhD and they want the money? So you don't want those questions. Engage with your community, whether it relates to your research or not. And this is really important here. A lot of the, the national opportunities out there, they they are specifically funding you as a future leader. And leaders do more than just work in their lab. So they want to see that you have a history of, well, I've been working with this community group. I've been uh, uh, with my church. I've been mentoring youth for 10 years or what have you. You want to show that you have vested experience working with a broader population. They don't want what I call like the service paradigm of the Ivy League, uh, the fallacy that is, where it, there's this cliche, high school senior, they're applying to Harvard. So they spent Thanksgiving break working in every soup kitchen, volunteering in nursing homes and reading to the blind. So they can say, you know, I did all this in one week and put it on their application. Well, the Ivy League's no better than that already. But the national foundations, they wanna see, you're not just doing service, but you have a history of this. And that will continue down the road. Um, and consider future opportunities that you wish to pursue and familiarize yourself with those programs. So like ECLS Mellon, I'm telling every social scientist out there, once you get to um, finishing coursework, apply for this, apply, apply, apply. Um, but you want to be thinking about that ahead of time because it is a robust application and they want a lot in it. You don't want to even six months beforehand, you can still start three months beforehand, absolutely win it, but it's going to be a lot easier of a process if you're thinking about these things early on. Uh, and when applying to graduate programs, ask about funding opportunities, specifically fellowships, assistantships, and tuition waivers. Ask your PI about research support. Uh, are they going to provide you with a stipend? Are they going to hire you as a research assistant in their lab? Um, some PIs will say, if you go and get your own fellowship from an external source, I'll give you a bonus of a couple thousand dollars on top of that. That happens on this campus as well as others. Ask those questions. You don't want to leave money on the table. And if planning to apply to pre-doc fellowships, uh, so when you're starting the beginning of grad school, ask a prospective PI for advisement. They're, they're happy usually to give you some advice. Uh, because they're trying to recruit you. And then always reach out for help. Your faculty and research advisors, fellowship advisors like me, fellowship programming. Um, just before we started this, Annie and I were talking about what could we do during the summer for NSFGRFP to provide some uh, specific fellowship programming for, your, for this audience. Um, talk to your financial aid offices when you need to. And then there are writing centers and career centers who, yes, they are here to help you get funding as well. Um, and this was just kind of funny. I think you'll laugh more at it when you get to the other side of grad school. But a student says, hey, I got a fellowship. Thanks for your help. And uh, the professor writes back, congratulations, good mentoring. And he thinks to himself, got to take the credit where it's due. Fellowship pursuing graduate funding. It's a team sport. Work with everyone who's on your team because we want you to win. And then, of course, if you have any questions, please reach out to me, fellowships at gradschool.utah.edu. And now, now it's your time. Uh, it looks like, Annie, there are some questions in the, the chat box. Yes, it looks like there are some uh, questions. We're going to just go ahead as you take a moment to read that final question. And if folks want to stay late, I just want to make sure uh, before we get to the questions, just to say this really quickly, is that to make sure that if you have any questions, contact the Office of Undergraduate Research. We can be visited at our.utah.edu or by emailing us 
or by calling us um, at 801-581-8070. We'd love to hear from you. If you're not on our listserv, please do sign up for our listserv. And now we'll go ahead and stop the recording and open it up for Q&A. Um, all right, and if folks want to um, stay on, you are welcome to stay. Um, if Dr. Pluster, you're available um, to stay on just a little bit longer. So there were some questions that came in and here we have from Janice. If I'm planning to uh, wait between graduating and applying to graduate school, are there things I should be aware of about funding? That is a great question, Janice, and I'm sure a lot of you are in this boat as well. Um, and uh, for, firstly, ponder on why why are you taking that break? Um, because you will need to address that usually in your competitive applications. And for some students, it's going to be, I, I want to get industry experience, so I have some enriched skills to take to graduate school. That's great. If you are taking a break because you're like, oh, grad school, I'm not sure if that's for me. And then you have great experience in industry and you say, like this has led me to understand getting a PhD is the path I need to be on. You need to take whatever that experience is in that gap and you need to talk about in your narrative why that was valuable for you. What did you learn from that? What are you, what is your takeaway? What, how is that experience going to enrich your time in graduate school? And oh, the students I work with who, have done this. They have so much to share. They're just so bashful. They're afraid to say that they spent a year or two years in industry, or they weren't sh they weren't sure beforehand. They feel like, oh, if I say I wasn't sure about pursuing school and I took a break, that that's going to make them look bad. On the contrary, thank you, Annie, for shaking your head like this. Especially if we take a look at what's going on in higher ed news, especially around PhDs, there's a lot of conversation of are we sending students through PhD programs as a way to put off being an adult for a few more years? And by saying, I, I took some time off to really make sure this was right for me, you're going to be more prepared than a lot of students going straight from bachelor's to PhD. So some things to also think about there is, how are you going to frame that experience? Like I said about your research experience, you don't want to use we, you want to use I. What are you taking away from that experience? What are the skills you are developing? What's the, um, what are you being exposed to that is a value to, to your academic and post-academia plan? Um, additionally, letters of recommendation, you're likely going to want someone from industry to write a letter of recommendation for you. In my experience, industry recommenders, they have a lot of really great and important things to say. However, they need a lot of coaching on how to say it uh, and what to include. So that's where, as I mentioned, you need to coach all of your recommenders, but especially those from industry. Here's what you need to talk about. Here are the points I need you to cover. You need to include this in your letter. Um, here's why this fellowship is important. Um, so those are just a couple of the things I'd say really to think about when you uh, take some time off between. It won't, yeah. it should not hurt you, um, but it will be a question at times. And I will also add to that, um, not taking time off, but going, let's say you're going into a master's program and you plan to get a PhD. Um, why did you not just go into a PhD? That's a question a lot of reviewers will have. And so you need to be honest. I have students who go like here at the University of Utah who are pursuing a master's in mechanical engineering when they could have just gone straight into the PhD. Why? They felt like they wanted to hone certain skills first that they could do more accessibly during their master's that will really help them with their specific research project. I have students in um, psychology here. They could have gone to from a bachelor's to a PhD at other schools here at the University of Utah, where they have a research advisor, where this is the top program for the, what they want to do here in psychology, you have to get a master's first. That's just the rule. So talking about that uh, sh shows why you're doing that. They want to see that if you're spending more time in school, you're doing so for a reason, not just to spend more time in school. 
Thank you, Dr. Pleister. And just one more thing on the break, I just suggest that because uh, once you're on that career path, it is a long haul. And so it is good for not burning out and wellness if you wanna go into um, academia and do a, like a terminal degree, an MD, PhD or JD to take a break. Um, well, I think we are at the end of time. And so maybe what we can do is we did have some questions that were received, but I think uh, Dr. Pluster, you answered all those questions uh, when I'm reviewing your presentation and what came in. So if folks have other questions, send Dr. Pluster a message or you can contact the office. We're happy to also um, connect you to resources. And I just wanna thank you, Dr. Pluster. That was amazing and um, what a good showing and so appreciate you for your time. And we look forward to collaborating on the next event. Um, and so thank you, everyone. We're going to end this, the session. Thank you. Thank you all. It was a pleasure. Bye.